we're going to start with the Holiday Inn and, and in downtown Wichita. So we go back to 1967 at a time when urban renewal was really shaking up downtown areas all over the nation. And Wichita was right there with them. The library was being constructed. Century 2 was being constructed on the south side of Douglas. And on the north side, we started to look at uh, the Garvey Plaza, the two Garvey buildings, and the centerpiece of that, of course, the Holiday Inn building. The original, I think, idea was for a 27-story building. I think it got pared down a few stories, but it's still going to be the tallest building in Kansas, which it was for many, many, many years. So we'll, we'll kind of start with 1967 and taking a look at the, uh, at the Holiday Inn and how, uh, how, that's, how its generation started. And of course, we'll take, we do have some, some uh, video too uh, eventually. But here's, a, here's, some of the, here's some of the basic designs. Let's start with, I uh, just wanted to ask the panel, did the, was, was having a hotel as the centerpiece originally part of the plan? Did that, uh, how did that genesis come about? And, and was that really the crown jewel? Whose decision was that? Not a contractor. <laughs> Not a contractor. Did, was it? Was that part of the city plan? Well, they just but built Century Two. They had just built Century Two, and they needed more hotel space downtown. Of course, the Broadview was already right there. The uh, so how did uh, how did the design of this building? It's very unique. How did the design of this building come to pass? Who wants to tackle that? Uh, I am. Dean Bradley, I, my older partners were really the, the uh, designers of this, Sid Platt specifically, and, uh, and I should say designing of the garden center, because this partial is like a pad site, uh, apparently control was through um, uh, a lease, long-term lease, and um, so Sid was involved in the buildings around it, and the concept of a tall structure. He had a plan where he uh, described it as a checkerboard, where if you're gonna put tall buildings down all together, uh, you ought to spread them out like the black squares on a checker checkerboard so that uh, you're not staring into each other's windows. So that's how the plan came about with the tower in the middle and two structures on either side. Uh, things beyond uh, changed over time and never was, were developed. Um, and I think the, the uh, land that was given over to the uh, Holiday Inn Corporation was kept as a, pretty much of a square and then the other buildings were fit around it. R.H. Garvey, the building on the furthest to the west toward the river was, was the earliest building and it was actually going up uh, and was finished before any of all the demolition had been done for the rest of the site. Um, Construction-wise, I know it was a, a cruciform, you can see in the plan on the board uh, on our left, it's cruciform, each wall between each room was a structural element, so they were wing walls that formed the cruciform, and it went up uh, the 22 stories, and then at the top there was metal construction that finished off the parts that cantilever out. The construction was interesting in that it started uh, at the bottom, and the base was more um, uh, typical construction, but then as it went up, it became a slip form system where hydraulics lifted the forms and they, they moved uh, 24 hours a day, and so there was constant filling of the forms, and uh, as it went up, then the, the floors were inserted. So you really did get a, uh, and there's some other views that will show the, oh, sort of the uh, honeycomb effect of this structure. And uh, I might talk, I know we're going to be jumping around a little bit, but um, uh, there, that, this is a, a oil done by uh, Ed Pointer. And uh, Sid in the office had it done for, uh, it's a six, five by six, piece of work, but it does show the structure before the uh, parking garage was inserted at the bottom of the, of the structure. And each, each room is its own cell, and so, um, you know, it did, uh, I know some of the questions are, how has the building held up? And it is, if you guys know, in the past we had a, a 
Holiday Inn still ran it, and they wanted a hollow dome. So on the sixth floor, there was a metal building that was constructed all the way around for about three floors, and it became an indoor um, hollow dome, which was popular at that point. And the uh, and it, um, although it had horizontal bandings of windows, and it was really sort of a, a tough a tough uh, image to, to work with, but uh, over time, the development, again, was not controlled by the gardens, and so it was always a sore thumb for them because they had no control over it. It ended up having multiple, yeah, there you go, <laughs> multiple uh, sunscreen uh, veneers put on the glass. It had, it was painted gray at one time, sort of battleship gray. Uh, the holodome was falling apart. It was um, drive it and, and uh, it was not holding up well. Uh, we don't have pictures of that, which like, I, I couldn't find any pictures of that phase during uh, in our slides. But it, um, it, it ended up being that um, it was such a problem with the Garvey organization that uh, once the lease ran out and it, it, uh, the hotel was failing, they wanted to tear it down. They actually had uh, our firm look at the concept of tearing it down. Well, we um, did that a little bit, but when they realized that when you tore it down, you're ending up with a view off to the north, and sort of an empty tooth in the, in the, in the plaza. So um, luckily, they just let it sit for a few years. Um, this also shows some of the things that changed. Uh, each room had a had single pane glass above, but a, um, a spandrel panel below, and the spandrel panel was up about three foot, so you would be in, in bed or sitting down and you could not see out, you could just see uh, sky. So that was changed, and, and so part of the rework of the hotel was to go back to, or go to, full height glass, so uh, the rooms are totally glass on each end, and uh, change the dynamics uh, incredibly. So it's weathered pretty well, uh, Ron probably knows more about, but it's, it's eight foot clear, each floor is only eight foot clear, and four and a half inches for a slab. So it's a real low uh, uh, vertical rise uh, per, Yeah, it was, was there anything super innovative about its design or construction? Well, I, the construction, um, and I don't know how this, I um, apologize for not knowing, but you know, Garvey Grain were builders of grain silos, and so they used slip forms on all of those. I don't know if that was a, a tie-in with Willard Garvey to, if you wanted to slip form, but I think that's pretty unique construction. Somebody, one of the newscasters uh, have a, or somebody has a, a time-lapse film of the thing going up day and night, day and night. And uh, so it was unique from that point of view. And we do have a video of, of uh, some of this. There's no audio on this, so we can talk over it. But we got this video because we were looking for this video of it going up. <clears throat> and they didn't have that, but they had this. Are there any other uh, are there any other buildings that are similar to this in the region or around, or is it pretty? I I I don't know. Okay. Well, it's a telephone. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And there were other tall buildings around. It wasn't like uh, it was the only thing going up. But these the ten story Garvey buildings were were half the size or two thirds of the size of the tower. Was it, did the public accept this building right away? Did they grasp on it? They loved it, and you know, the, the restaurant on the top floor was very popular. <clears throat> Views are great. Um, that's the uh, OW Garvey building, and, and of course all this, this is a real hub of activity because of the tower and then the guard, the kiva around it was all being built at the same time. The movie theater, there was a theater to the north. Did you want to 
Yeah, it was a Fox movie theater. Yeah. Built in 71. Yeah. Because all I can remember in my lifetime is people complaining and bitching about everything that gets built. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that there were buildings that went up that people actually were looking forward to. <laughs> That's a contractor problem. Yeah. But if you don't know, it has been converted to apartments, and they're always leased. Uh, parking's on the first six floors, so you park the car, and you go into the elevator, and go up to your place. That may be it. And has this, has this building held up well over the years? Is it still, I mean, obviously it's being still used, but... Is it viable going forward, and is it still going to be part of our skyline for a long time? I think it's going to be, you know, this, even, uh, back to that, you know, it just shows the strength, and it actually shows the, uh, what Frank Lloyd Wright called the tree structure, where it's narrow at the base and spreads out and further out at the, at the top with the steel structure. But, you know, structurally it must be in pretty good shape, and uh, part of the conversion to apartments were cutting holes between the cells and in about half of the wing walls. Um, so I think it's holding up pretty well. Maintenance is, uh, they're keeping up on the maintenance and, and it seems to be pretty viable and, and popular with residents. Were there any challenges with the construction or did things go pretty well? Mm -hmm. you guys know. Ron <laughs> wonders how the span of four and a half inch slab works. <laughs> he overbuilds everything. So. <laughs> but it does, I mean, it's amazing the, uh, the structure. Uh, when you're in an apartment, I've, I've had a friend that was living upstairs, and uh, I mean, it's quiet, it's, uh, the views are great. It's still single pane glass, we got rid of the the bronze glass and the spandrels put, put the more um, solar band type single pane windows in and uh, it's doing pretty good. I'll tell you just a little bit about the structure. I mean, Dean was saying those walls are actually 10 inches thick throughout the height of the building. And then, and then as the forms were going up, at least according to Rock Platt, this was before my time, I guess they inserted keys in the the walls at each uh, slab level so that they could come back later then and cast the four in, four and a half inch floor slab, which uh, spans the walls are twelve foot eight on center, so the, the slab spans eleven foot ten between those walls. And, and Dean's also got some. Uh, photographs also because one of my thoughts was well you know I can see how you, a lot of jobs you slip form a core or something where the core of the building is actually laterally stable more or less because you got walls going in each direction but these were just kind of 10 inch walls standing there so one of my concerns was well how did they keep that braced and like some of the photos Dean's got shows that they kind of followed in behind casting the floors in as the uh, slip form was going up so that those walls never were you know too too much unbraced uh, otherwise you know there would have been lateral stability problem. Because of the way it was constructed, I've always heard it would be extremely difficult to dismantle. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. mostly, uh, I mean, really any cast in place concrete job is, we've done a lot of load testing of cast in place jobs, and they'll carry a lot more load than they were ever designed for. And generally, I mean, if they're done right, when you try to knock them down, takes quite a bit of energy to do that. And there's always that argument too between is a building timeless or is it, oh my gosh, that was built in 1971. Is, this was built in 1971. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe my question is, what yeah. what makes that difference, or is it just is it just the way the public <laughs> perceives and handles things like that? Well, I know the uh, Garvey Center now that they control the building. Uh, they've used some mid-century modern furniture down in the lower level off the Kiva where the coffee shop is, where the Reverie is. Uh, you know, they've tried to play it up, finally. You know, it, it for, again, it went through so many ugly transformations with the paint and the, um, the sun was obviously a problem, and so they used so many uh, uh, sun screens and sun products that uh, it just, then they were all bubbled up so the glass had to be changed, and luckily we got them. The, but you can also see on this sort of a patchwork or a, a pattern of uh, individual room units for heating and air conditioning. So every room has control, but they, you had to have a, a, a louver in each corner of each room. So they're, they're floor-to-ceiling windows, except where the units are uh, located. But it, it, you know, it's held up because of that flexibility with the mechanical system and now that the at least um, as, as apartments it, uh, it does seem to be working pretty good. They're bigger by the way the top three floors have larger penthouse two three bedroom units and then a community room where the old restaurant was facing mostly to the west and to the north. Has there ever been any thought about putting a restaurant back up there or is that done? I bet you it's not a, it's not yeah. Yeah. I know they always complained about the elevators didn't, there weren't enough elevators to really serve that. So that's another consideration for reuse of a building like this is how are the elevators going to handle uh, more traffic up to the top. I hate to ask, was that a flaw? Was it, um, or was it just a, the way things were done? And you know, the, when the Holiday Inn was there, uh, there was restaurants, there were restaurants down on the uh, Kiva Mill. And so they had, it was more of a specialty restaurant up at the top. And uh, so I think they, they made it work. But uh, it, uh, it's, the views are, of course, wonderful from up there. All right. Uh, another one of our iconic structures we want to look at, we'll move, it, we'll move ahead about five years. And just uh, a little further east on Douglas, to take a look at uh, the 4th National Bank building at Douglas and Broadway, pretty iconic corner of business and commerce through the years with some great structures, and we'll focus on the, the northeast corner. And the Fourth National Bank, of course, just moving a few blocks to the east, and coming up with a new building with the Fourth <coughs> Financial Center. And, and let's talk a little bit about the genesis of this building. What was the, what were uh, the people at the Fourth looking for? And I knew they were looking for to make a splash, obviously, and get a new building going, and, and uh, make sure that something was pretty special at this point. Well, it, it, as near as I recall, uh, they, they were looking for an iconic building. In fact, uh, came very close to building a high-rise that was going to be uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 stories high. But then they decided that uh, it was easier to uh, make a splice down where people could really see it. And so they uh, went to the firm of Skidmore, Owens & Merrill out of, in particular, this job in Chicago and uh, found some uh, guys up there that had been working on the uh, Sears Tower. And it was being built roughly at the same time, just about a year ahead of the Fourth Financial Center. And uh, it, it, you, all of you probably have been in that building, and if you haven't, as an architect or engineer, you ought to take, take a tour uh, through that courtyard and just see the uh, area and see how designed it really is with uh, the future. And of course all of those uh, 16 towers that uh, really structurally hold up the building uh, have HVAC in them, all the electrical in them, all of the other controls, stairways, uh, both for going floor to floor and, uh, and uh, exiting in primarily in fire purposes. <laughs> but uh, you, you'll find it to be unique, and uh, as uh, we'll show here with uh, some slides going forward, uh, we'll talk about things that are unique to the building. Uh, and we have a, uh, 
a, a video that we'd like to start off with to really talk about that part. Yeah, we'll take a look at the video and uh, kind of a press conference that kind of announces that and got the whole project started. And you'll see uh, Jordan Haynes and Dwight Button here. And it does have sound. Yeah, we do have sound on this one, so a little extra bonus. On January the 7th of this year, our board of directors voted unanimously to proceed with construction plans for a 387,000 square foot building to be located in the 300 block on East Douglas between Broadway and Topeka. This property, now owned by the 4th National, comprises approximately 90,000 square feet with 300 feet uh, frontage on Douglas and extending to a depth of 300 feet to the north. This is a nine-story building plus a lower level, extremely functional. As Dwight has mentioned, there are 387,000 square feet gross area. To put this in proper perspective, to give you a little insight into what that really means, our Civic Center, Century 2, ground level and promenade, everything above the ground at the Civic Center encompasses 293,000 square feet. This is 32% larger than the Century 2 usable area. This is a massive building, it's 400,000 square feet. Uh, truthfully, we had two plans. We looked at a high-rise building and it just didn't do anything to us. Uh, or for us. Uh, they all look alike, really, when you just look at them around over the country. This is a new creation. And the video does continue, but with, without audio, so we'll let you take a look at, at the video as we continue to talk about it. But uh, that atrium is, it's a massive space, and there's nothing else like it in Wichita. Yeah, I don't think there's anything like it uh, in the state of Kansas. Uh, it is unique. It's designed to to be a real entrance to uh, to the banking facility and to a new downtown area. It was unique to construct. Uh, if you notice, and we've got a drawing here in a little bit that I can show you, that uh, it has uh, four alert, uh, very large uh, skylights, and. Uh, Skidmore is one that uh, designs things right up uh, very uniquely and very much to the edge. All of those were, uh, the, the design of the skylights were put through test, uh, 165 mile an hour tornado uh, velocity and uh, hailstones as large as baseball uh, dropped on it and uh, it's strong enough that we never had uh, any of the glass or hasn't had any of the glass break since then. Along with a very unique uh, way to clean those. Uh, a lot of people thought it was terrible wasted space, but it did cause uh, uh, the ability to have a unique outlook at night and during the day and then uh, was uh, topped off by uh, Calder Mobile, which uh, we'll talk about again in a little was the was the original plan to have that atrium outside was or was that discussed i i, I really don't know ted but i think that uh, what they did is they did talk about both both uh, methods of having the atrium uh, but they uh, felt that uh, with our unique uh, weather patterns it might be a little better to have it inside and uh, it served uh, very well it does look like tremendous tremendous wasted space but Interestingly enough, the top part of the atrium has no HVAC. It's, uh, it's on its own. And uh, it uh, really keeps working pretty well over the last 40 yeah. plus years. I was going to ask you, is it, was there challenges keeping a space that large temperature control? Uh, not down no. where the people are. Okay. <laughs> and it has HVAC down there. And of course it has the escalators up and down. Uh, has a, a, a 
what would be called a sculpture elevator in one corner, all out of polished bronze, um, has uh, steps down to a, a large uh, meeting room down you know, below the, the atrium that uh, served the bank and then other uh, functions very well. And uh, it's a great place to have a party. In fact, talking about parties, during the construction of this building, AIA, being a real party group, decided that they uh, wanted to have a party in a, a new under construction building. And so as we were pretty well complete with the structural portion of the building, and the glass was up in, in the third floor, uh, AIA had a party on two wings, one of them with a rock band in uh, one area and uh, another one for old folks uh, to have just elevator music to dance to. And, uh, we, as contractors, we were very concerned about uh, how much alcohol was going to be <laughs> because uh, there were portions of it that really didn't meet the code for a party. Uh, but uh, everything worked out fine and it, where the rock band was, I'll never forget that the uh, structure right around was castellated beams. You call it that? Yeah, there was some of that, and then there was also composite. Composite, trusses, too. Trusses. Anyway, lowering the rock area, that thing started moving up and down, and I thought, oh, God, what would happen if that damn thing would fall in? <laughs> but I mean, it was moving. You could see, you'd have a glass of water on the table, and the water would just shake it. Uh, so it, it was uh, unique and fun and a, and a good idea. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have that kind of money anymore, so <laughs> AGC is going to have to throw the party next time. Uh, interesting thing, uh, talking about those kinds of things. The two men that you saw in the uh, in this short clip that, that they have, of, uh, Dwight and Jordan, there's, there's no question that those were two unique individuals who didn't want to do things for the city, didn't mind stepping forward and uh, taking some risk and having a party on the third floor while the building was un under construction. And you can tell by the voices, if you really paid attention, the different personalities of Dwight and Jordan. There was no goddamn idea that anything was going to be any different than what he wanted if Jordan Haynes said that was the way it was going to be. <laughs> and that's just the way he talked. Um, in fact, he used some other colorful language, but I know the girls here and they can't handle it. <laughs> uh, but it, it, was, it was an interesting thing for that, from that perspective to build. Now you've got, um, and we, we, talk, we were going to talk more about the apron too, about the, uh, the Alexander Calder <coughs> mobile that you can see there hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it's, how it got here to Wichita is also a pretty interesting story. And, and, and uh, let's delve into that a little bit. A pretty unique piece of art for Wichita to have. It was a very unique piece of art. And a fellow by the name of Bruce Graham was the lead uh, designer of this building, uh, the Skidmore in Chicago. And uh, they all wanted it to be unique, as Skidmore does with about everything that they build. But uh, they came up with the idea that they wanted to have some type of a iconic uh, sculpture in the, in the area, and Dwight had been interested in uh, Calder for some time, and uh, he, needs, he and Bruce Graham thought, well, that's just one hell of a night. Let's just do a Calder in there, and I, I don't think there was any intention for it to be hanging in the atrium. It was to be a four-mounted uh, sculpture to start with. And then they went over, Dwight went over, and I think Bruce was with him, Bruce Graham, and uh, they went over to meet uh, Calder in France. And uh, he said, well, I think he, they showed him uh, pictures of the, of the building and the, uh, as it was planned and, and the atrium. And uh, they both decided, along with Calder, that, that it ought to be a hanging sculpture. And so Calder did a very unique thing. And they, he, they made mockettes of 10 different sculptures for that atrium, which are some places around town now and very worth the price that they paid for them uh, today. 
and uh, and we uh, got involved with them to show how we could hang it and make it work, and uh, there it hangs today. How much does it weigh? I think it's a couple of tons. Were there, uh, were there any challenges in getting it installed? Oh, it's, there's always challenges in construction. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a radio business. <laughs> No, there were challenges just to get it get it in, and of course all those are painted by the hands of the master, uh, to, and not to get it all scratched up and then to fly it into place and have it hang there. And uh, it was a challenge for our steel workers to do, but they could carry on with the task very well. And uh, uh, we had an iron worker superintendent at the time called. Uh, Jim Red Blankensop, and uh, Bruce Graham liked him as did the uh, uh, guys that really worked on the job. Uh, Ed Thompson was one that uh, is a K-State graduate and uh, went to work for Skidmore and came in. He was uh, pretty much the on-site guy uh, for the construction. Uh, the bank had a fellow by the name of Jack Allen who was very involved in the construction and uh, trying to make it work and be reasonable and argued with Dwight and Jordan all the time, but uh, Dwight and Jordan always won. And uh, uh, there it hangs and all of you can see it very easily. Well, we have this slide up here. Talk a little bit about the lighting of the, of the building, especially at night to kind of showcase that. Well, <laughs> Because they, they wanted it to be iconic, they uh, obviously had to have this atrium really be a focal point. And um, they did all kinds of, it took weeks to get the lights located the right way. Uh, many of the light fixtures out of this building, both for the workspaces and the atrium, uh, were purchased at a, not a real normal price because at the time we were involved in the, being involved in deciding what lighting ought to be in this in the structure, uh, the Sears Tower was being built. And the Sears uh, Tower had uh, diesel construction as construction executives and uh, Skidmore said to uh, the bank, why don't you hire the, the uh, diesel construction to be your oversight construction executive for, uh, for this building. And, uh, it was unique working with them and, and having them offer all of the things that they could uh, about lighting, where to buy things, and how to get things done the right way. We had challenges from time to time, but we lived through them. Do you know what the name of that piece is? I don't remember, Ted. I, I, never, I never knew until I, I looked. It, it's called Elementes de Montables, Dismantled Elements. <laughs> so, impress your friends with that. All right. We never like to dismantle things. We like to uh, so, yeah, there, and there's the uh, Fourth National Bank building. Well, well let, let me tell you, you know, the, the interesting thing that, that I was always fascinated with is the way they designed the HVAC and the, and the lighting system within the whole building. Because uh, if you... Uh, a look at uh, the structure of those, those towers individually going up, which were not slip form, but they were built with rubber-lined uh, forms and uh, were unique uh, and tried to be almost like uh, having a marble uh, without any lines in it. And if, you, if you're ever over there and look at it, it's pretty much exactly the same color on every tower. And uh, there's not, you, you may mention the word honeycomb, I think, Dean. We weren't allowed to have honeycomb. <laughs> and uh, different, different process. But it's interesting how they were able to use all of those uh, different locations for job. In fact, one of the uh, challenges that we had, and I was, Jamie thought Hale Ritchie might be here. The very first pour we made in the north east corner of the building on one of those towers. We got finished and you can see the four lines on every 
four line about every two foot, and I made him tear it down. And Hale said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to furnish the rebar from the rebar supplier, and you're going to furnish the concrete because you didn't put the right amount of water in it, put the water cement ratio in it, we're going to repour it. And uh, he said, oh my God, what am I going to tell my dad? <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted him to tell his dad the problem and not me to have to tell <laughs> my father the problem. <laughs> And the, uh, the final building we're going to kind of concentrate. Oh, go ahead. Hey, Jim, you calculated what the cost, price per square was for that building. Well, at the time, it was about 50 bucks <laughs> per square foot. And I know all of you would like to be involved in a building like that today. <laughs> uh, but I, don't, I, 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 I wonder today if we could do as well on a building today uh, as we did that one. But we had everybody involved uh, from the EV side. In fact, I, I brought along a book that we have in our library, Jamie. <laughs> it's My Joyous Life as a Hard Hat. And the superintendent on the job wrote a book about his experience of building this building and then some other ones. Uh, his name was Dennis Elkenfeld. He was a young guy and uh, he went on to Started another job for us, which the government shut down. We had to close him off, close it off, and he found another job. He was a good guy, and we were very sorry to lose him. But uh, he 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 really got a challenge out of this job, and we had there's enough. Well, I'm not sure there's enough. But, uh, Howard Shaver was our project manager, and he was a he was a real old uh, World War II vet, and uh, he had Dennis jumping through hoops, and they didn't always get along, but uh, the final product was worth the efforts they both put in. You've also got a nice museum piece here. Yeah. Part of the... Uh, now, out of our library. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I called the architect, I called SOM to get the drawings, and I, you know, I'm sure that you don't get requests very often for your <clears throat> historic yeah. drawings, and they're like, well, let us connect you to, your, to our librarian. And I said, this is how you know you've made it. You have a librarian on staff that keeps all your stuff in order. So Jim makes fun of me, as you can tell. <laughs> and this is a nice piece from the Wichita Eagle and Beacon from Sunday, October 13th, 1974, when you can see how large the newspaper was, and you have to have upper body strength to actually read the newspaper. <laughs> just, just for a section, and you, you know, and it's printed enough to, so that you can actually read the book. So you can read <laughs> And, and, and it was moved into the Labor Day of, of 1974. So now let's move ahead about another 10 years to uh, the mid-1980s, and uh, we'll focus on the Epic Center now, and Larry Hatterberg will take us uh, through that time period here from KTV. Oh. Sorry. Such as unemployment and a decrease in population would seem to be overshadowed. A definite construction boom has been underway in this section of Wichita, and more is coming. It all started with the groundbreaking ceremony for Century Two back in January of 1966. Some twelve and a half million dollars went into this public investment, and despite problems in the past year, the image for the city is still there. The Garvey Center contributed to the building boom with the two Garvey office buildings, Page Court, the new and unique Kiva, and the Holiday Inn, the tallest building in Kansas. The complex also includes the Fox Garvey Theater, the first downtown theater to be built in the United States in more than 31 years. The new Central Church of Christ on North Waco also adds to the beauty of downtown Wichita. On the river to the north, the new downtown apartment complex known as Continental Village now has almost 200 units. Now under construction at Main and First is the Farm Credit Bank building. And more beauty is added to downtown Wichita with the attractive landscaping surrounding the 320-car parking garage adjacent to the First National Bank. On the north side of the downtown area is the Union National Pavilion Bank at North Main and Central. Moving east to Market, the major addition to the KG&E building includes a new color in our nighttime skyline. The 600-car parking garage constructed by Macy's at South Market and William attracts much attention with a walkway connecting the garage with Sutton Place and Macy's store. 
Moving east again, Southwestern Bell Telephone Company is in a new 12-story building and just completed in the 300 block of East Douglas a 12,000 square foot addition to Bricks Menswear. The two and a half million dollar public library has been well used and admired, accented by fountains and attractive <coughs> landscaping. The Allied Building at 355 North Waco features a unique interior design with a very special attraction for executives who really need to get away from it for a while. <laughs> Sometime when you're not feeling up to par, conveniences in these new modern office buildings can help. <coughs> this is Larry Hatterberg reporting. <laughs> you look at downtown Wichita. I just wanted to make a comment about one of the things that uh, was said by Larry, because he didn't, you know, he, he really always does a great job, at, except this time he didn't have his facts straight. Uh, Century Two, because I was the superintendent on Century Two, so I, I had some involvement with that. Our contract for the general construction was twelve and a half million dollars. Ended up being after some change orders about thirteen, but that did not include the HVAC nor the electrical, and I can't remember whether it included the elevator. So it did, it did cost about, as I recall, about $18.5 million. The Epic Center, as you can see there, uh, the course, one of the original plans was for two towers, and we, there may have been ideas for more. Uh, and as you can see in the upper right drawing there, the idea, I think, was for it to be taller than the Holiday Inn so that it would be the tallest building in Kansas. And those exact specs are right there. <laughs> it, it, it would be 87 feet taller than the Holiday Inn. So that, the, that was part of the goal all along. And uh, could someone start to tell us about what were, was the idea for three towers on that, on that general property? Well, I was in the office, but I was a younger partner and involved in other projects, so I really didn't get to see all of this. But going through the files, uh, Willard, being the Renaissance man he was, um, he had sketches using a big, fat, black felt tip pen, and he had, uh, oh, three towers and four towers uh, sprinkled around the site, and they were all square with the world and flat tops. And finally, he, he has about, uh, I found in the files, about five or six uh, examples of that uh, kind of thinking. And finally, on the last one, he said, uh, he contacted Sid and said, Sid, can you make this pretty? And P-U-R-D-Y. And, uh, and so um, I think Sid was, um, uh, was always able to keep um, Willard more in control is from what I've understood. And uh, he got uh, the idea of rotating the towers, putting a slope on the top, separating two towers with a gallery, more of an urban uh, street level uh, experience. And uh, unfortunately, just the south tower and just a tiny corner of, the, of that uh, gallery was built. But ironically, you know, the, the Holiday Inn was part of the Garvey Center down south, and Epic Center was Garvey's project, so he was sort of just wanting to outdo what was down at the south end. Who wants to tackle uh, the design of the building and then how that eventually came to pass? Yeah, kind of like uh, Dean was talking about earlier on the Holiday Inn, uh, Willard was a light concrete. And uh, we looked at both steel and concrete for this building, and uh, eventually kind of ended up with Willard that the concrete system would be the one we would want to go to. The exterior structure is actually the finished uh, look of the building. And I know Sid at one time, he was one of the have more of a, you know, better looking cladding on it, or more expensive cladding. And, you know, Willard was into minimal maintenance and that type of thing, and they'd had good success with putting these coatings on a concrete building, so he didn't see any reason why not to make this building the exterior be concrete. The other thing about the design, uh, 
And I think the building looks really good from the distance. The lower couple floors, I know one time Sid was working on having a little bit different design on the lower two levels to open it up more so that, you know, from the street view, you know, the building had a little more character to it. But again, Willard being the cost conscious type of guy he was, you know, well, was that going to be more expensive? And yeah, it probably was. So it ended up just carrying the same design all the way to the base. Structurally, uh, this building is kind of a tube within a tube. The exterior, and it's a column free space. The exterior walls are 10 and a half inches thick, and the interior core walls are 12 inches thick. We used, this I think was the first use of high strength concrete in the state of Kansas. Uh, the Walt Keeler Company and at that time also Delisi were working on high strength mixes and that was about the same time super plasticizers and fly ash and that was all becoming uh, part of the mainstream. So in order to keep the form work simple and to keep everything as minimum as possible, we used 8,000 PSI concrete for the first four stories in the exterior walls and the uh, core. Then from four to eight, we used 6,000 PSI and then 4,000 PSI above. And by doing that, we were able to keep the, you know, the reinforcing to, you know, reasonable levels, keep the formwork all uh, uniform throughout the height of the building and then, uh, you know, minimize the, the size of the elements. The other thing about the building, when I first was working on it, the building is actually perfectly square. So just framing it normally with the framing all in the same direction, the walls which were carrying the load, I, we were having trouble you know, you just couldn't make 10 and a half inch walls work. So then we decided, well, since the building's square, why don't we alternate the framing, <coughs> rotate the framing on alternate floors. So that's what we did. We alternated uh, the framing on each level so that basically all the, the walls are carrying the uh, same uniform load. Like in this, uh, photograph here on the left side, the building sits on uh, 48 inch diameter drilled piers <clears throat> under each exterior column there. Those piers go down a uh, little over 50 feet. You know, downtown Wichita there's basically four or five feet of silty clay. Then there's sand down to about 35 feet. Then you hit weathered shale, and then uh, at about 50 feet you hit uh, weathered shale with gypsum seam. So those piers are bearing, uh, I think we had 50,000 PSF in bearing, plus pretty substantial friction values. But in the left photo there, you can see uh, since there's water down, uh, 12 or 15 feet below the street level, all the piers had to be cased. So that was a vibratory uh, element that uh, vibrated that steel casing through the sand. Then they screwed it into the weathered shale to seal off the water and the, uh, the sand. Just one of the concerns then, that kind of shook the ground. Of course, Occidental Plaza was right across the street, which is about a hundred and some year old building that had, you know, walls weren't in that great a shape. So they had to sit, <coughs> Donlinger or someone, they set up a seismograph over by the Occidental Plaza. 
so that they could tell. I mean, obviously, they didn't want to end up buying the Occidental Plaza building. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was a concern with that vibration method of doing the drill pier. Uh, below the center core, some of those earlier photographs, you could see uh, there's a five foot thick mat uh, below the center core. There, I'm standing there in the red jacket, and Mark McAfee's in the red and white jacket back in the days when our hair was dark. And, uh, basically, the top of that mat is down. I think the elevator pits were like 12 foot 6 deep. So uh, the basement floor was 15 feet deep. So top of that mat's about 27 and a half feet below street level. And then, of course, uh, five foot mat, so you're down about 32 and a half feet below street level. So they had a lot, lot of dewatering system to, to be done there. Uh, and under this mat, there's 48 inch diameter piers, there's four of them in each corner. And then, uh, you know, kind of a grid work uh, throughout, throughout those. Uh, go on to some of the other photos. Was the roof was the roof always intended to uh, to be that shape, or were there any other ideas at the time? I think it, as far as all the time that I was involved, the roof was always that shape. Basically, there's 21 floors that are the full four floor plate. Then there's a 22nd floor that, you know, is smaller and then a 23rd floor that's smaller than that. At one time there was a plan uh, to put a restaurant up there that Willard was going to call it Emerald City. <laughs> and uh, it's really a pretty nice space up there because the 22nd floor kind of overlooks the 21st. So it, it'd be a really you know, with a vaulted ceiling. I mean, it could have really been a really nice space. The 23rd floor, I think, is, there's a mechanical, and then there's a 24th floor that's actually a steel grid work up in the corner where there's served two functions. One, to brace the tall walls as they went up, but also there's a lot, a lot of mechanical equipment up there. So when you look at the roof, although now there's antennas all over the place, but when the thing was first built, I mean, that was a clean roof. There wasn't anything uh, projecting on the roof. The building's uh, 327 feet tall, and uh, the uh, Holiday Inn, which you can see in the background there, it, it was uh, <coughs> I think 257 feet tall to the top of the elevator penthouse. So it was about 71 feet taller. I think the earlier graphic showed 87, but that was more to the primary roof of the Holiday Inn rather than the pen elevator penthouse. Uh, the other thing about the pitched roof, it allowed all of the elevator uh, penthouse equipment be housed under the roof so there wasn't any need to have a penthouse on top of the roof. And if you could go and maybe try to find some of the formwork of the floor system, uh, you can kind of see it up there, but maybe it was a better one. Maybe that's the best we had. The structural system was a wide flat beam system, we used what was called a skip joist system, where uh, a concrete joist system, you're usually thinking of like a 30 inch pans, but back about that time, uh, to get a two hour floor system out of concrete, you had to have a four and a half inch thick slab. So with 
30 inch pans, why the four and a half inch thick slab was kind of a wasted, uh, it really worked easy, so they came up with a system of using 66 inch wide pans. And the idea was to be a 66 inch wide pan plus a six inch joist gave you a six foot module. On this building, we actually had to have eight, eight inch joists because the six inch wasn't, uh, wasn't enough to span and keep the deflection criteria in order. Uh, I think it's 30, 35 or 36 feet from the core out to the exterior. So, so you've got a 35 or 36 foot perimeter all around the core that's just column free space. <coughs> I know earlier we talked about is, has the building held up well? It's 20 years younger than some of the other buildings we talked about. Is it, has it held up well over the years? Is everything going, going well? Yeah, I think I, it has. I mean, the, the really, as far as I know, I haven't been any issues with it. I was in there about a month or so ago uh, in one of the attorney's offices. Sat there for a day in a mediation meeting where uh, Apparently attorneys can't, it was, a, it was about a mechanical equipment, but apparently attorneys don't know that structural engineers don't design the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sit in the mediation meeting for a day and put to my contribution. Really, but, uh, no, I think it's held up real well and it, it makes a really nice space actually uh, with that Parameter and of course the views out of that building are excellent. Uh, it's a very rigid building, so you don't. I mean, the floors walk like you're walking on grade, and uh, I think it's really worked out well. I mean, it's unfortunate that we weren't able to build the second tower and the galleria and that, but you know, at about this time is when everybody started exiting downtown, so, uh, you know, the leasing really, I don't think really went as well originally as they hoped, and, and that type of thing. I know we did want to leave for some room here at the end for any questions. If anyone uh, wants to address the panel, anybody have any thoughts? What year was the last building open again? 1987. <laughs> What was at the bank for site for that building, or fourth national site for the building? Do you remember, Jim? Yeah, if, you, if you're old enough to remember the Miller here, the Miller Stater was where the parking garage is. Okay. A Buck's department store was on the corner of Broadway and Douglas, and some other uh, retail outlets, and, uh, and the J.C. Penney building was just north of the Buck building. And it uh, ended up being remodeled to be the uh, computer building for the bank. Okay, so since we didn't address the elephant in the room, which is Century Two, I'd like everybody's opinion on Century Two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can start off, Steve, with the guy that built it, and that's me. All right. So, what should, what should we do with it? Well, I, there are things that need to be changed. Uh, and if you've been to certain performances, particularly in the Little Theater, if there's a, what's his name, Rod and Hot Rod show going on over in the Stop exhibition it. space, it rattles it. Um, and I'm told there's not enough room uh, from the backstage to the center core wall. Uh, that elevator structure that's kind of between the exhibition and uh, conference uh, area, it is too small for today's vehicles, and but it, it, that would be pretty simple for a good engineer to solve. And um, they're all retired. Uh, they're all retired. Oh, I'm just and uh, it, it's uh, one of the things you know. But what's interesting about almost all of these buildings that were constructed, I I was superintendent for about half of them, Wichita Library. It's single pane glass. Century two single pane glass. Bank four single pane glass. 
And of course that uh, has changed a lot over the last 50 years. And uh, So what should we do with it? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it probably, I, I hope they can come up with some type of a structure that would not totally tear it down. I think that'll be a, that'd be a fun challenge for a wrecking company. Um, and, and utilize it as a performing arts area, take the uh, exhibition space uh, and conference space out of the building and, and build on to the Bob, Bob Brown uh, exhibition space to the south and uh, have it in that complex. Now there's, there's other areas that uh, a new performing arts cultural center could be built. Uh, you know where the Alice Hotel is and several places. So it'll be it'll be interesting, but it won't be eighteen and a half million dollars. <laughs> Ron, do you have an opinion? Well, I, I mean, I think that building, I think that building needs to be saved. And one of my concerns. Okay, say say we did. I think let's build something really great and neat. So let's tear that building down and then we end up doing like we typically do in Wichita. We got beautiful renderings of all these jobs and then all of a sudden we end up not doing anything nearly what we start out to do. And I think it'd be a shame to tear that building down and then we end up building something that we're not proud of. I think, I would think there's, you know, I'd be creative enough designers in Wichita to figure out how to make that building work, in, in my opinion. And I think we need to keep it, you know, one of those studies that they paid a quarter of a million dollars for, <laughs> wanted to wrap it in aluminum composite panels. I mean, how, yeah, I, just, I couldn't believe that. But, uh, if that was true, one of your ideas. Yeah. 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 We've been talking about high-rise structures, and one of the things I've always, uh, and I work, you know, just across the street from my office, is located in the Kiva. And, uh, but one thing I've always noticed is we've got the taller buildings around it, and it makes such a great statement. It's just spread out, and it's broad, and it's, Reminds you of the prairie. I just think it needs to be used somehow, and uh, uh, there's lots of opportunities to, to even enhance the writing and influence because it was designed by uh, right uh, architects that were trained at Taliesin. So, I mean, it's got uh, problems, as Jim has said, but you know, it. it uh, something creative, and even if it has to be added on to uh, using the circle motif, I think there's a lot of potential with it. I'd like to see it stay. Jamie, thank you for letting me hijack your No. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you all coming, and let's, can I get a round of applause for these guys?